Uh, Deputy, no, do you wish to come in? No, Deputy Morgan. Um, thanks for that second part of the presentation, I suppose, uh, Peter, and whatever about the Department of Finance and the, the Minister, you can, certainly I think this committee has given you a fair um, opportunity to, to air your, your, your fairly controversial views in terms of mainstream thinking. Very brief, I'm wondering, what's your best case scenario in terms of wrapping up Anglo? How long would it take, approximately, if the decision were made to, to wrap it up, including negotiation with bondholders, etc.? My experience, judgment in this, and I've talked to other people with experience and judgment, is four to five years. Because th there are some uh, wor workout uh, time scales and whatever to be, um, to, to be gone through. But in terms of robust decision making, robust negotiations, open, honest, transparent, that's the sort of time frame it can be done. If there's a will, there's a way. Less than 17 billion less than what has been proposed at the moment. Uh, just to go recap on the meeting of 16th of June, Alan Dukes, the chairman, presented his report. It should, of course, have been Donal O'Connor. Donal O'Connor was chairman. He'd been on the board since June 2008, and it was June 2009 when he, uh, 2010, when he retired or handed over to Alan Dukes. With his experience from the accounting world and from you know his positions held in many things he should have he asked, should yeah. have been presenting Mr. that report just, just, just to ask, answer the questions that have been asked please uh, well you asked me about anglo well, and this is very relevant to anglo uh, sorry it was deputy fahey they the chief executive mike ainsley said admitted albeit reluctantly and uh, delayed, it, was no, it could have been admitted much earlier, that 22 billion of uh, unrecoverable, irrecoverable loan losses were embedded in Anglo. And that's not right, it's 32 billion. And I can prove that too. And I don't want to clutter up your minds here, but it's 32 billion. And I said it to Mike Ainsley on the Monday following that presentation of the 16th in his office. Can you break down the 32 billion? The breakdown of it? It's very easy. There's a 72 billion loan book in Anglo. They admit that 30, well, 36 billion has been transferred into NAMA, and it will have loan write downs of not less than 55%. They have a remainder of 36 billion, comprising 12 billion of what they say could be a residual rump of goodish loans to form a bank with 2.5 billion capital, and the remaining 24 billion is not performing satisfactorily and would be wound down. I think any expert who knows the composition of that portfolio and the clients involved and the businesses involved, as I do and others do, would know that of that 72 billion loan book, the most that will be recovered is about 36 billion. That has to be used, deployed, to pay off customers' deposits, bank deposits that don't fall within the guarantee, and then, if there's anything left over, to pay senior and junior bondholders. Another point brought up at that meeting um, uh, on the 16th of June was that they had made a profit, Anglo had made a profit of 1.8 billion on what they called a liabilities management exercise, buying back bonds with a face value of 2.4 billion and using 600 million cash to buy them back. And that therefore, they made a profit of 1.8 billion. Anybody with experience knows that the per people who held those bonds and sold them back for 600 million would regard themselves as having made a profit of 600 million because those bonds are effectively worthless. Anglo is so deep in deficit, it should be closed. There is no argument for keeping it open. No logical argument. And the same for Nationwide. Thank you, Costello. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Matches. <coughs> I have to agree with you. There's no logical argument for keeping Anglo-Irish open. And uh, I don't think we've really seen the bottom of the pit even yet. Mm -hmm. Costello, if we close it, we will actually then get to see we'll it. Will eventually, yeah. Uh, and I have to agree that I'd like to see a situation where all the board members should have to resign 
indeed right across the AIB, uh, Bank of Ireland, uh, Irish Nationwide, and um, Anglo-Irish, of course. But, uh, and, of course, the guarantee, we would say, has been thrown far too widely to include both Anglo-Irish and Irish Nationwide, both of which are effectively zombie institutions. Uh, but, you know, can the tide be reversed? Can the situation be reversed? You can say that it can effectively be reversed if the will was there to reverse it. But there certainly doesn't seem to be the political will to reverse it at the present time. And I can see the government uh, going out of office in the just immediately. So by the time that would all the political changes would take place, NAMA would have conducted all its business. Presumably, it would have purchased all the portfolios and it would have been so deeply engaged in the work that has taken place that effectively there would be no going back. You know, sorry to interrupt you, Deputy Costello. You know the old term in business, sailor return. This is a situation of it's sailor return. Get them back to the banks, capitalise the banks and direct the banks properly. And it's not wasted money to professionals. It's actually been a learning experience. We have a problem in the sense that legislation has been put through in relation to um, NAMA and the guarantees and there is a difficulty in that respect. That is, is the law of the land. Um, <clears throat> but just to, to look at it, if NAMA does provide the it purchases all of those uh, portfolios, and whatever it pays for it, we can argue about that, uh, paying too much already. But does it not effectively recapitalise those institutions? I don't think there's anything can be gained from the recapitalisation of Anglo-Irish. I don't see it ever as being a functioning bank, but certainly in terms of Bank of Ireland and in terms of AIB and indeed the EBS. Um, and as a result of that, it's, it's recapitalisation by the back door, so to speak, because the bonds will have been transferred to the banks. They will have encashed them with the European Central Bank. They will have got cash into their hands. They will effectively be recapitalised, and they should be in a position to do what you are saying, even though it has been an expensive exercise. So will the, will the effect, my question is, will the effect be the same? Uh, except that it will be a more expensive way of going about it and it will be a slower way of going about it? The answer is no. The bonds that are issued to the banks by NAMA are not encashed at the ECB. No, they are not. This is, there is a technical misunderstanding by so many people. The bonds in the hands of the banks are an asset that qualify for as security, collateral, for loans from the ECB. So they have to bring those bonds to the ECB like a watch to a pawnbroker, and they are accepted as security for a loan from the ECB. And there's nothing, there's nothing the requiring the, the banks loan, the to loan, bring those to the, bank, to the ECB. Loan, the loan can be transferred into cash. If the loan do is that, cash if at a price. That, no, they get the bonds. They can then go to the ECB. They can come out with cash from the ECB. No. Isn't that a fair No, they that get a loan point? if they wish. They get a loan of about 80% of the face value of the bonds from the ECB. And that loan has interest rate. <laughs> uh, it has to pay half percent above the ECB rate. That's what the banks have to pay for the loan that they'll get for offering the security of the bonds. So when, I mean, what else can they do with the bonds either, other than go to the ECB and come out even with a loan? It still is cash. Hold the bonds because the bonds pay an income of, I think it's 1%. Don't hold me to this because I've had so much in my head at the moment, but it's over three month year IBOR. So the banks actually get income off the bonds, the NAMA bonds. 